be reading the last uh, four, verse, uh, Ezekiel 7, verses 14 through 20. Listen for the word of the Lord. They have blown the horn and made everything ready. But no one goes to battle, for my wrath is upon all their multitude. The sword is outside, pestilence and famine are inside. Those in the field die by the sword, those in the city, famine and pestilence devour them. If any survivors escape, they shall be found on the mountains like doves of the valley, all of them moaning over their iniquity. All hands shall grow feeble, all knees turn to water. They shall put on sackcloth, horror shall cover them. Shame shall be on all faces, baldness on all heads. They shall fling their silver into the streets, their gold shall be treated as unclean. Their silver and gold cannot save them on the day of the wrath of the Lord. They shall not satisfy their hunger or fill their st stomachs with it, for it was the stumbling block of their iniquity. From their beautiful ornament in which they took pride, they made their abominable images, their detestable things. Therefore, I will make of it an unclean thing to them. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There's a reckoning in our lives. And I'm not talking about the final judgment, you know, that day when we'll all go before God. But the truth is, there's a reckoning in our lives. If we don't do the things now that will take us to the place we want to be 20 years from now, we won't get there. I tell young couples when they come in my office for premarital counseling or for other kinds of counseling or just young people in general, you've got to live your life from the future backwards. You look 20 years out and look back and say, here's what I want to be 20 years from now. Look back at today and say, what's it going to take for me to get from here to there? Otherwise, we don't get there, do we? Israel lived that way. They didn't pay attention to God's law. They didn't do what God's will was. And they didn't end up where God wanted them to be because they never really looked out there to see what was coming. And what was coming was Babylon. In this passage of Scripture, we see that the Babylonians have encircled Jerusalem. They're about to scale the walls and come in. In just a few chapters later after this, uh, I told you last week in Ezekiel, God leaves the temple. And the people of Israel believed that as long as God was in the temple, Jerusalem would not fall. They had a, self, a, a confidence that was not real. Kind of like us. Nothing bad will ever happen, right? America will always be strong. That's, I think, that's what the Romans said and a few other dynasties over time, right? Nothing bad can ever happen to us. Uh, we'll always have oil, right? Climate change, that's a bunch of baloney scientists figured out, right? None of that stuff's real, is it? And that's just on the global scale, right? In our personal lives, nothing's ever gonna go wrong. I can live paycheck to paycheck forever, right? I don't have to put any money aside. Jimmy Cricket, right? I'm okay. Those are things that we like to think today because we only think today. We're not thinking 20 years out, looking back at today. And if we do that, if we look back at today, we might find we would change our ways, right? I might do some things differently if I know what's going to happen out there because of what happens today. Today. It's important to live from the future backwards. Israel had gotten themselves in quite a mess, hadn't they? And they're about to be sent into exile, captured, something they thought could not happen. Judah was about to be destroyed, Jerusalem torn stone from stone. And it's hard to imagine that in our lives, isn't it? And yet, every week in career networking, we have someone coming in, don't we, Ron, it seems like, who tells us that story. Their lives have been torn stone from stone. 
they worked 20 years at a job and all of a sudden somebody takes that company over and that whole group is gone and everybody's on their own. It happens at a time when everybody else is looking for work and now they can't find work and they lose their home, they lose their car, they lose their savings, they lose everything. And it's a reckoning comes in our lives. Sometimes it's our fault and sometimes it's not, but it does come, folks, let me tell you. We watch people struggle to keep a good attitude, struggle to keep on going. Week to week, week to week. I've seen people in that group that have been out of work for three years. It's hard. There comes a time when a reckoning will be there. I remember in Lake Dallas visiting a lady, and I hope none of you fit this situation. If you do, think about it. This to the lady who wanted me to go in and talk to her husband who was dying. He had lung cancer. I'd never met her before. Never in my life have I met her. Never met him before. They had been in church in 45 years. A preacher had made that man. We're good at that, let me tell you. You know, blame us. It's always our fault. I don't know that. But a preacher had made him mad. Won't tell you which denomination, it's irrelevant. We've all done it, right? Not like lay people ever do the same. You know, I've got many of my But I go in and sit down with him and I, I said, Well, we need to give up cigarettes. And he said, I've never smoked. Oh, you have lung cancer. That must have been a special kind. And so I visited with him for a while and he tells me his life story and Asked me if I'll do his service when the times comes, and I said, yes, I will. And, and I go sit at the kitchen table, and there is a ashtray full of cigarette butts. He just told me he didn't smoke. And his wife has one lit, smoking away, and it dawns on me. He didn't smoke. She did. She did. And he was dying of lung cancer because of her. And I'll be honest with you, friends, I did not have the heart to tell her what she'd done. And I hope she never figured it out. There's a reckoning that comes in there in our lives. Our actions do affect our lives. How we live today will affect what happens 20, 40 years from now in our, our lives, in our children's lives, and the people that live around us and with us. It does make a difference how we live. So now I know you're about to be really excited because I'm going to move into the children's part of the sermon, all right? We're going to tell a story about Edward Hayes. I told it six years ago, I figured out, but I think it's time to tell it again because some of y'all are new. So, Edward Hayes tells a story. He, he wrote some really good books. Go look him up online. Uh, St. George and the Dragon and the Quest for the Holy Grail is a great book. All right? If you've not read it, it's cheap. You know, it's been around for a long time. You get a used one for about $2, I think. So uh, go, go look it up. It's worth read, reading. But he tells a story about a young boy who gets mad at home. Does anybody ever remember those days, right? Just mad as all get out. And he was probably eight or nine or ten years old, and he takes off running. Oh, come on, he's going to run away. He doesn't even have anything with him. He's so mad, he just left. And he's out the door, and he's running down the streets, and he runs block after block after block. You know kids that age, they can run forever. And he runs block after block after block after block after block. And finally, he's getting a little tired, so he ducks under a bridge that goes over the river. And he's sitting there under the bridge, and he flops down. And he hears this voice. What are you doing? And it's an Irish accent, which I don't do well, all right? But uh, this little man, little man about this height is standing there. He has a little green hat on, a little green jacket. And he grabs him and he says, are you a leprechaun? He says, well, yes, I am, lady. He says, you get one wish, you caught me. And so he says, I want to be the richest man in the world. Okay. And the leprechaun picks up a rusted old Folgers copy can and hands it to him. If you can fill this can up, you'll be the richest man in the whole wide world. All right. 
So he goes home and he starts making straight A's. He stuffs his grades in the can. And he becomes the most valuable player in the Little League and he puts his trophy in the can. And he, he becomes a great musician and he puts his, his music in the can. And he, he grows into high school and he becomes a star quarterback on the football team and he puts that in the can. And he, and he becomes a, well, he gets to date the head cheerleader, of course, right? You know? And he, he puts her picture in the can and he puts his golden glove from baseball in the can and he, he makes. He scores out the Wazoo in the National Merit Scholarship, plus he gets an athletic scholarship to a great college, and he goes there, and he, he graduates magna cum laude, and he puts that in the can, and, and he gets a great pro career in sports, and he puts all that in the can, and, and then he, he, he gets done with that, and he's wisely invested his money, which most pro people don't do, but he wisely invests it, and he keeps investing, and he puts all his stocks and his bonds and his deeds and his royalties and everything else, he just keeps putting them in his can, and, He's just not rich enough yet. And he finally, he's on the top of his penthouse on his huge skyscraper, which he owns outright. At his big desk, at his telephone rings, and he, he seals the deal and becomes the richest man in the world. And he stuffs that contract in the can, and he goes, Ugh. and he dies of a heart attack. And the can floats over the edge of the balcony and floats down and down and down and finally ends up in a neighborhood and rolls down the street and rolls up into a yard. This little girl goes and picks up the can. And she notices something interesting about the can. Both ends have been cut out. And she does this. A butterfly. My kitty cat. The flowers I planted. What have you got there, darling? Says her mom from the porch. And she gets her mom right there in the middle of the can. She says, Mom, I found a magic Folgers coffee can. I'm the richest girl in the world. So what are you going to fill your can with? In Ezekiel it says, they had all the silver and gold they could handle. They just couldn't eat it because they had no food. Every time I do vacation Bible school, I get to know kids. Every time I get to know kids, as they grow up, they know me. Every time they know me and I know them, whenever we're in church and we see each other, we high five or we bump this or we say hi or whatever it is, and I become rich because of that. That's what makes me rich. When I know you, Ephraim, I'm rich, right? And we kind of know each other, don't we? Because we've done vacation Bible school together. Yeah, you know? And that's what's real about life. Who do you know? Who do you know? And what I found is, every week at the end of vacation Bible school, I'm worn out. And somewhere during that week, Jesus has happened. And Jesus happened this week at Vacation Bible School. One little girl, I've got to tell you this story. They're all little to me. I know that. She's a bigger little girl. She's about this tall, I guess. Her sister was having a rough time and needed to go to the bathroom. And so she says, I'll go with you. And and they both went by, and I watched big sister love little sister. And care for little sister, and take little sister in, and make sure little sister was okay, and bring little sister out. And Dad said later, that doesn't always happen at home. But um, when they're out in public, they're really good. But you know, I saw Jesus. You know what I mean? I saw Jesus in these two little girls. He was rich. I saw Jesus in kids. They had to put little dog tags on chains, and, and they did that in my group. And, and to watch a kid that wasn't quite dexterous enough to pull the little chain out of the little holder and put the tag on it. And there would always be some friend who would help them around them. Nobody ever went without somebody's help. 
in Vacation Bible School. It was amazing to watch every day. It was so awesome. So, let's see, 20 years, I'll be 79. And I hope I'm retired by then. But looking back from the future, I think I want to still be doing vacation model school. They may not let me get down on the floor because there may not be enough of them to pick me back up. But you know, I don't know that I want to miss out on that. There are such wonderful young people in our church. And they have made our church rich. So every time you see a Folgers coffee can, they make them out of plastic and I don't understand. But if you see one, you man, I don't care which kind. We already cut the other end out. It's not what you put in the can, but what gives you, what God gives you through the can that counts. And all the gifts we have in life are from God. Miranda. Remember, if you get arrested, you have the right to remain silent. Everything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. It's kind of Ezekiel's message here today. But let me give you a different twist on it. You have the gift to remain silent. And when you do, God will speak to your heart and show you a better way. And He, He and He alone will make us rich. Let us pray. Lord, speak to our heart of hearts. Help us find that place deep within where you live help us realize that you fill our can from the other side. It's not what we can put in it, but what you've already given us. Lord, reckonings will come. And put around us those people in your spirit that will get us through. And when reckonings come in other people's lives and they're no longer able to do what they need to be doing, Help us be the friends who lift them up. And together, Lord, we will be strong. We will stand strong. And we will be rich. First in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.